Dave, good to see you. Thank you very much for Thank being you, Ash. here. Good to be here. So I want to start macro because today is about the emerging market sell-off. And how do you see that affecting global oil demand? Well, we see global oil demand still staying strong. Uh, that uh, We think there's going to be growth in the demand in the uh, upcoming years. Slight issue today, absolutely. Th things come up every day, but overall, we still see oil demand growth being very strong. How sensitive do you feel uh, to prices and the price sensitivity of emerging markets that are no longer dealing with, say, subsidies? How sensitive are you to those issues? Well, you have to understand fundamentally that we based our budget on $50 oil and $3 natural gas. And so we run a very disciplined uh, business from that standpoint. So prices go up, uh, prices go down do the issues like this quite frequently and and we can't we work on long term projects uh, so we can't constantly adjust our program based on issues like this so if we see a trend emerging for some period of time this can impact our program will adjust, but but uh, smaller changes like this, we don't see having any change in, the sh uh, in what we're trying to do. Bigger changes come from trade and trade agreements, and right. we have maybe something with Mexico, maybe not with Canada, maybe not with China. Uh, how does that affect where you send your oil and natural gas? Well, overall, we want a, a strong economy here in the U.S., and we want a strong economy in North America, and so that will overall impact demand. So we would like to see uh, some sort of agreement at REIST that's mutually beneficial to everyone just to keep the economy strong in, in each of these countries. So it does have some impact from that standpoint, but as far as where we actually send or where we actually receive oil from, that's really driven by is the actual demand there for that individual product? Do we have agreements that we can sell the product at a, at a good price? If you lose Mexico and you lose China, do you feel like there's enough demand in other countries for you to keep sending your natural gas and oil there? There's, that would have an impact. I mean, if China falls off significantly, that would have an impact on, on global demand. There's no question about that. Mexico, on, from a natural gas standpoint, uh, we are counting on growth. It is slowly occurring, and uh, we think that's going to be beneficial. But overall, we think when natural gas is probably in the $3 MCF environment for a long time. So uh, that brings us more broadly to the conversation about shale players and risk. So a few years ago, it was all about, I believe in shale, you're going to deliver great products, I'm happy to give you money, and then I'm going to wait for that free cash flow. When you take them, look at the macro, emerging markets, China trade, it feels like it's a risk-risk now. It's a riskier profile to invest in shale players. What do you say to that? We think that we, particularly at Devon here, are really taking some of that risk out. We are developing a consistent program. We know that the resource is there. And so what we are doing is consistent, spending consistent amounts of capital uh, in the highest quality shale plays in onshore North America. It's growing our free cash flow. Uh, it's going to, we're growing production, growing cash flow, taking our cost structure down at the same time. And we have a very, very deep inventory of pro uh, projects that we can execute. So this trend will be very consistent for a longer period of time. And we think that's what the investors are really looking for, is a profile out of companies that can take the risk off as to going up or down so much and deliver consistent results over time. And that's that's the profile of the company that we have. Uh, it feeds into a Bethany McLean uh, op-ed in the New York Times yesterday that really caught the attention of the industry, basically comparing shale play right now to the tech bubble in the 1990s, that the era of free credit, low rates, fueled this boom in shale, and that when the rates go up, it's going to reverse, and there could be this big uh, blowout. How do you respond to something like that? Oh, I disagree with that. Uh, well, I know that's a surprise, <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, fundamentally, the most important thing is the resource is there, and we have figured out a way in order to get that resource out in a very economic fashion. Now, has low interest rates in the search for yield caused a lot of additional capital to come in to private equity, uh, particularly this influence in the industry for them uh, and causing some inflated prices, frankly, or for the acreage, et cetera? Absolutely. That has taken place. But that doesn't take away from the fundamental economics and the fact that we can make a reasonable return at these kind of prices. Uh, by drilling horizontal wells, uh, fracking those wells, and producing oil and gas from them. And, that, and that's going to continue. So then it leads us to like the capital allocation question.
question. Um, if you're living within cash flow and you get extra money, kind of what do you do with it? Is it CapEx? Is it shareholder return? W- what's your priority? Again, we've developed our budget based on $50 oil, $3 so you're throwing extra. throwing a lot of free cash right now. We're going to throw off a free cash. We're, we're going to get into, we are somewhat has, but we are getting to the point where we're throwing off free cash. Absolutely. And so we're not going to adjust our plans. We are staying with consistent plans. As we generate free cash flow, those will be available to go back to the shareholder. Uh, one for one? I would say pretty much one for one. We'll always look at other opportunities, but right now the priority is returning that cash to the shareholders. And uh, some companies like Diamondback, for example, Concho, have used that money to go buy assets in the Permian Basin. Um, I know you're divesting assets now. Um, at what point would you be looking for more assets? Well, we have a very, very deep inventory. And so we don't have an immediate need to replenish that inventory. Uh, now, we always are out there looking to see if there's something, particularly around our core areas. That we say, everyone wants nice, contiguous assets. Yeah, so everyone wants the longest lateral. So yeah, yeah, and so, you know, if you can find some acreage that's going to allow you to draw 10,000-foot laterals rather than 5,000-foot laterals, that makes economic sense uh, to do that. But that's just coring up around our immediate acreage. But as far as large-scale acquisitions, we just don't need to do that because we have a deep inventory. Uh, it does fold into the McLean uh, op-ed in that there are so many players in the Permian, in particular small private players, that have really used those low interest rates and capitalized on that uh, to be in business when some say maybe they shouldn't be. Uh, how many players do you think, aside from the majors, will be in the Permian now versus, say, 10, 5 years from now? You know, it's very difficult to predict, Alex, exactly how many, but I can say there's too many companies. Uh, their consolidation would be helpful in the industry. We don't need all these management teams uh, running around to, in order to efficiently develop the resource. And there are really just a handful of companies that have the technology that is uh, needed to really develop these resources the most efficiently. Devon is one of those. But I can tell you, we're going to be very disciplined on the acquisition side. Mm-hmm. We're not going to go out and overpay for an acquisition just because some company uh, uh, has some acres and they don't know, really have the ability to develop it. So consolidation should take place through time in a theoretical standpoint, but I think it's important for ourselves and frankly for the whole industry to stay disciplined about how that consolidation takes place. And moving to cost inflation, because we have uh, the jobs report on Friday, and so the conversation in the industry is how much are you having to pay up for labor and can you find workers? We can. We absolutely can. You Do know, you pay up more for them than you did before? Not significantly ourselves for our own workforce. Now, if you look at some of the services that we use, the drilling rigs, the frack crews, things like that, yeah, I think it's a little bit more difficult for them to pay uh, to uh, acquire workers. But when you look at the overall cost structure uh, that we have, without any of the additional efficiencies we've had, I'd say our cost structures uh, for drilling and completion and tubulars, uh, everything goes into well, gone up maybe 5% or so this year. But we've been able to more than offset that with the efficiencies of how we're going about drilling our wells, completing our wells. And so we've been able to really actually drill more wells for less amount of money this year than we did last year. Is that going to be permanent for next year? Well, we see... Or what's your biggest cost threat, cost threat for next year, I guess is a better question. We see drilling rigs uh, going up somewhat, um, uh, pressure pumping staying relatively flat, tubulars relatively flat. The great news about Devon is we have locked in our cost structure really through 2019. We mm-hmm. saw this coming, and so we locked it all in. On the sand side that we use in our hydraulic fracturing operations, mm-hmm. we're going to more what we call regional sand. We're going to be about 75% regional sand by the end of this year. So you cut out the transportation costs that we had from transporting oil or transporting sand primarily from Wisconsin previously. So we are actually finding ways to lower the cost structure overall. Uh, and that leads me to the other big issue in the premium, which is the bottleneck and the takeaway capacity and the differential we've seen from Midland prices to Houston prices blowing out as much as uh, $20. So Schlumberger was out yesterday and said that they do see significant bottlenecks and activity is starting to slow in the Permian Basin. From your uh, wells, do you see that? Well, we're seeing that overall as an industry. But once again, our marketing team did an outstanding job there. We have 90 percent of our oil that is locked into WTI type pricing. If you look at the overall price we received in the Delaware Basin for our oil, 
as and because we got uh, it was 98 percent of, of WTI in the previous quarter and we have it locked in through the whole year because we have firm transportation on the Longhorn pipeline to the Gulf Coast as well as we have intra basin swaps between 50 cents and a buck off of uh, WTI so bottom line is we anticipated this coming mm -hmm. same story in the stack too we received their 98 percent of WTI so we saw it all coming so absolutely is it an issue for an industry it is but not for Devin.